This week on Crossfeed. How would you rate the movies? NIV Bible getting an overhaul. Religious persecution in Dale's former state of Iowa? The Gospel according to Bono. And what is God's Twitter name? Hello, everyone, and welcome to Crossfeed Religious News. I'm Pastor Dale Critchley, pastor of Shepherd of the Ridge Lutheran Church in North Ridgeville, Ohio, near Cleveland. <clears throat> I'm Pastor Jim Butler, pastor of St. Luke's Lutheran Church in Dedham, Massachusetts, just outside of Boston. And it's good to see everybody again this week. Yep. Back to our regular format. Had a, we'll, we'll talk uh, at the end about uh, some of the feedback and stuff from the last episode. If you haven't gotten a chance to watch it, I encourage you to, to go check it out. Um, it just got a, a tremendous amount of feedback on it. So that was really cool. Most popular episode ever, and it's not even been out for a week. Uh, yep. So good stuff there. Um, sound like you've had a positive week? Yeah, you had a good week. Um, staying busy, lots of cool things going on, getting ready for Labor Day and having some family come and visit, so excited about that. Skippy! I'm so happy! So, haven't really seen anybody, you know, for a while, and don't get to see people for a while living this farthest away from home we ever have, so looking forward to that. Yeah, well, we are, uh, I had fun. We moved our youngest daughter into uh, the dorms at her school, and today I, uh, Went out last night. I went out today, and I think you'll get a kick out of this, and rented her car space, a parking space for her. <laughs> Which we had to do through a realty company. Really? Wow. Do you want to know what a parking space goes for in her area? <laughs> I bet it's not cheap. Take a wild guess. I I couldn't even begin to. Well, we'll go we'll go for a month. I don't know yet, Pinky. I have no idea. Hundred bucks. Two hundred and fifty a month. Two fifty for a parking space. Yep. Wow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's that's a good price. That's a very good price. They've gone. For, I saw them for three hundred and fifty, four hundred and up. <laughs> Oh, wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. we don't have that problem here. You know, we, we live, we, we're surrounded, our house is surrounded by parking lots. <laughs> We've yeah. got plenty and of parking lots. And it's not a, it's not a covered lot. Nothing, you know, go out there in the winter, 250 bucks to shovel your car out. Wow. So, yeah, it's a little bit different out here. That's a little bit different. Anyway. Um, and now for something completely different. So, like we said, last week was just really a, a very positive show. A lot of people liked it, liked it very much. But I had one question at the end. What do you think they would rate it? Uh, you know, it's uh, funny because we've talked about uh, rating our show and, and how we would do that. And, um, you know, we used to have a clean tag and we decided, well, you know, it's it, we discussed some pretty adult topics and that. So, don't want to get the impression that it's appropriate for all ages and because it's really not. Um, and, uh, I mean, I don't let my kids watch it. Well, my oldest one, if she wants to watch it, she's in high school. So, um, but, uh, yeah, we've got a group called movie guide, um, that wants to put an end to the motion picture association of America ratings. So they say, you know, G PG, PG 13, R and C 17, all that, just get rid of it. It's, it's no good. You can't trust it. And, um, so, and, Okay, my first question is, right, it says, the rating system never worked really well, and it's gotten much worse since it added the ambiguous PG-13 rating. Be quiet, then watch the film. And that, that immediately, I saw that, and I went, wait a minute, PG-13, you know, that was, that rating came out about the same time as Gremlins, which was a horror movie, really, even though it was kind of marketed as a family movie. It was a horror movie. 
And, um, I mean, they even made a breakfast cereal out of it. I still have the jingle going through my head, but, uh, they, um, that, and, um, it was one of the Indiana Jones movies. Indiana Jones and the, uh, um, the Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. Temple of Doom. And actually, that movie was what gave birth to it. Because that was rated PG. And people thought that that was, you know, you're too young to remember this. Uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, that happened when I was on Vicarage, actually, back in, uh, 1983, 84. And people thought that movie was too, uh, adult for smaller children. Yeah, absolutely. And, and so I'm not too young because I was, I was, I actually <laughs> went to see it in the theaters. And yeah, it was pretty intense, you know. It's funny because you watch it now and you go, oh, whoa. <laughs> How is that PG? I think it's pretty intense even to this day with the, the whole pulling the heart out and everything. I Still beating, um, yeah. But yeah, but it's, it, it you know, it, okay. <laughs> oh, by the way, I like this. Parents, especially mothers, can no longer trust the rating of the movies. So my wife really can't trust them, but I can. I mean, I love it. So what's this especially mothers thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, especially in light of PG thirteen ratings for movies like The Love Guru and Land of the Lost, and our ratings for pornographic movies like Bruno. I haven't seen Bruno. Um, but yeah, and I even, was going to see Land of the Lost. That looked like a loser of a flick. Just watching well, the trailers. I, you know, I want to see it because I Will Ferrell sort of a guilty pleasure for me. Um, I, I really, I, I enjoyed his older movies more than his more recent ones. Um, but, uh, and I haven't seen Land of the Lost yet, but it's in my Netflix queue. So we'll watch it eventually. I haven't watched, uh, I haven't watched any of his movies that I won't. Um, you know, uh, uh, I don't know. I mean, the movie guy, you have to understand, it's an extremely conservative group. As if the entertainment industry must return to the kind of system it had during the golden age of Hollywood and the golden age of television, when it was a wonderful life in America because Mr. Smith went to Washington, uh, two Frank Capra movies, notice. Uh, Ricky still loved Lucy, uh, well, at least on screen. Um, and the bells of St. Mary rang out across the whole land. I have no idea what that meant. Um, <laughs> yeah, and the, the, this is uh, from a blog on uh, Christianity Today. And uh, he says, really? Is Ricky and Lucy's marriage really a model? Seems like many, if not most, of the episodes involve one of them deceiving the other. Funny, yes, but still, deceit was the rule. <laughs> you were the strangest boy I have ever met. So, um, okay. um, and, and they actually want to okay, not just I will get rid of the ratings. Myself. They want to get rid of any NC-17, R, and some PG-13 movies all together. This is madness. Right. Which is a little a violation of a little thing called the First Amendment. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, I mean, I will agree that the rating system is not perfect. Mm -hmm. You know, there, it isn't. Um I'm sometimes figured out, try to figure out why some movies got rated one thing and, and some things another. Um, you know, I mean, I, I'm not sure sometimes on, on who makes these, you know, decisions and, you know, are you allowed, you know, some, you know, certain words be said so many times and, you know, and then it goes into, you know, R or, or PG 13 territory. Um, but, you know, really that should just be a, a, a a piece of the decision-making process for going to see a movie. You know, that shouldn't, um, as a general rule, um, I don't go to see R-rated movies. I just don't like them. I just The language, generally the intensity, the violence uh, gets to me, although I did enjoy uh, Matrix. That's one of the few I, I, I have seen and, and watched. And there's a few others that I have on, on occasion. But as a general rule, I don't care much for them. Uh, but uh, on a parent level, you know, that's got to be just a, a part of it. And you got to ask, you know, let's check out why. One of the things I think where they improved it is it says uh, rated whatever it is. And then down below in the extra box gives you reasons why. Mm -hmm. uh, that I thought I found very helpful. Um, 
there is uh, Screen It, which is a, a wonderful source uh, where he, this guy go watch the movie and he counts exactly how many cuss words, exactly what's going on. And it has this whole matrix of things to kind of let you know what's going on a little bit, which I think is a, is a helpful uh, thing. Um, but I mean, you know, the other thing is you got to use parental judgment. But I don't know about you. I mean, I, when I went to go see Dark Knight last year, and that was a wonderful movie. But there's people bringing in, you know, five and six year old kids. I'm like, this is not a movie for five and six year olds to watch. Oh sure. Yeah. Well, it's it's like the um, the Harry Potter thing, you know, bringing little kids to to Harry Potter movies, which are not really, especially as you get further on into the series. They get pretty intense, and uh, um, well, and Lord of the Rings. I know a lot of parents that took their kids to see Lord of the Rings, little kids, um, because oh, it's a it's a Christian you know book and everything, or for that matter, The Passion of the Christ. I mean, which is one of the most violent movies ever made. In fact, I just read an article this week comparing it to a um, to a zombie movie. I mean, they're sort of it was a a satire and, and they're saying, yeah, the zombification happens at the end and, and stuff. But I mean, in this article, he's, he's talking about the sort of rending of flesh and, and stuff that puts most zombie movies to shame and, and stuff. And like, yeah. And people were taking their little kids to it. I mean, I'm the only person in my family that went to see that movie. And, um, and so, I mean, that, that was wow. And I mean, yeah, you know, I took, uh, um, I think Josh should go see that. He was a freshman in high school at the time. And uh, we said, neither one of us liked it. <laughs> we were out there going, I didn't really like that movie. I didn't either. I don't see why anybody, you know, it's talked about what a wonderful film it was. We were both kind of lost by it. Um, maybe we watched it again. But, yeah, but people have got to use some judgment on their own. And, yeah. um, you know, so Odd, I'm not sure. I just thought his... Uh, 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 thing was it was interesting. Well, you know, like I said, there's definitely movies. There's there's a few. I was thinking about some movies that I would have rated differently. Um, Disney's Hunchback of Notre Dame was rated G. Um, the villain's main motivation was lust. Um, there's uh, child abuse in it, and you know, I mean, just all sorts of really nasty stuff um, in there that I went. Wow, you know, maybe for older kids, but I wouldn't really call this G. I wouldn't consider this something that a you know four year old should watch. Um, and uh, uh, Mama Mia, that was PG thirteen. Um, I would have rated it R. It was it, that was one of those movies that um, a, a four year old could watch because they wouldn't get all the the the, the whole movie was just dripping with innuendo. Um, but as they get older, then all of a sudden. Oh yeah, you're too old to watch this until you get quite a bit older. <laughs> and uh and we actually just watched a movie uh called Maid of Honor. And um and and that was when it was rated PG-13 and we're watching this going there is no way that a 13-year-old should be watching this movie. And just a lot of the it wasn't nudity or violence or anything like that. It was a romantic comedy, but it was there was just so much um uh sort of sexual discussions and things like that uh that we just went yeah no you know this really isn't appropriate but like if if our kids want to watch a movie um and it's and we're not you know we don't know a lot about it uh especially if they're going over to a friend's house or they want to go to a movie with a friend and we're not going along or something um, or if we're deciding whether we're going to go see a movie as a family, uh, we go to ChristianAnswers.net. They have a movie spotlight section, and um, which is is probably similar uh, to the one you mentioned, and and they go through and they have um, they don't like give exactly the number, but it's pretty close to that. And they actually tend to lean more conservative than we do. Um, we're like, oh well, there was you know, there's a beach scene and there's a lot of girls wearing two piece swimming suits and, you know, and, or, you know, short shorts or whatever. And I'm going, okay. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I'm, I'm not real concerned about that. Um, but you know, but the nice thing about it is the more descriptive, it, descriptive that it is, 
you know, then you can look at it and say, okay, I don't care about this. I do care about this. And then, um, you know, and then there's also comments, other sort of user ratings and stuff like that. And people offer their thoughts and that's really helpful. I mean, it does mean that generally we're not going to go see a movie on opening night. We're going to wait for those reviews to come in. Um, which, you know, frankly, we don't go see many movies in the theater anyway. The, you know, you get a big family and it's, a little expensive to go do that, especially now that we've moved further east. Movies get more expensive, closer to the coast, I guess. Um, you know, one thing you talked about R-rated movies. There's there's been a few that we watch every once in a while. We'll watch an R-rated movie. We will not watch um, like we've got a Netflix subscription. If it's a um, you know uncut, unrated, you know kind of thing, we skip that, no matter how good it sounds. Um, a lot of times we'll watch a movie um, that we'll, we'll wait, we'll, we'll see the description of it and go, you know, that looks pretty good, but it looks like it's going to have some stuff that we really don't want to pollute our minds with. And so we'll just wait for the TV edit, you know, and when it shows up and it's, it's been edited for content, then we'll watch it. Um, really good example of that is the wedding crashers. That was a really great movie, but the opening scene, I mean, we, we turned it on and, and, and we, we rented it and we started watching it and we went, yeah, we don't want to watch this. And we turned it off. Then we waited for it to show up on like TNT or TBS or one of those stations. And then we recorded it there and watched it. Well, then it was pretty good because <laughs> then it cut out, you know, all that gratuitous nudity and, and stuff like that. That really doesn't add anything, you know, that's there for the, I don't know. I suppose it's there for the guys, <laughs> you know, but I'm not interested in seeing that stuff. So yeah, there was um, a movie on Lifetime that I was reading about uh, one time, and I was uh, I don't know. I like I like just paging the internet movie database and looking up just movies and about them, and then it's fun to look at alternate versions. This one said, um, you know, it had been a Lifetime movie, but in the DVD version, they they put in two or three topless scenes, you know, in order to draw the guys in. So you know. Uh, but by the way, Mamma Mia, it should be rated R just for ABBA music, you know? Oof. Hey, anyway. Like uh, ABBA. <laughs> the, if it, no, what it should be rated R for is Pierce Brosnan singing ABBA music. Uh, <laughs> no, actually, I, I, I actually am an ABBA fan. My wife tries her crazy, but I actually like ABBA. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's move on to... Oh, gosh. Let's... um. Let's go back to your home state here. Okay. Uh, what's this going is, on there in Iowa? This is not only my home state, but this is our former superintendent. <laughs> totally. Wow. Yeah. So you, you knew this guy. I know this guy. Um, not real well, because wow. he was there when we got there. And, um, and then he left shortly afterward. Um, but, uh, Greg Ebeling is the superintendent in Spencer, Iowa. And, um, they had a proposed religious liberty policy that would allow students to critique Darwinism and study the Bible among other things. And, um, and really the idea of this policy was, um, to give, uh, teachers some sort of guideline as to how far they can go as far as expressing their faith. All right. Now, the school district that we were in, that he was once the superintendent of, um, actually, they had Wednesday night was church night, and all activities had to be done by, I think it was 5.30. And, um, and, and then so the kids could go to uh, confirmation classes or youth activities or whatever. I and mean, it wasn't even called like family night. It was church night. And, um, and they had, uh, I mean, they would do like at the concerts and stuff like that. They would do, uh, you know, Christmas songs, but then they would also do like Hanukkah songs or Kwanzaa or, or something like that too, you know? And, but I mean, they even had uh, their, uh, sometimes the choir, that beautiful choir concert, uh, at the church across the street. 
and um, which it was great because it really helped just with the atmosphere of the whole thing. And it wasn't that all the songs were religious songs or anything, um, but it was just the you know the it had really nice acoustics and stuff like that. And so, but getting back to the story, um, they <laughs> proposed uh, a class that would be the uh, these are electives: the Bible in history and literature, and critique of. De- my goodness, of, uh, the Bible and history and literature, I mean, you could study Shakespeare from mixed biblical references. You could study um, uh, the movie Godspell. Um, you could do the play Jesus Christ Superstar. You could do, um, uh, uh, my goodness, talking about history, King James uh, Version uh, was one of the founding things of English. Luther's translation was one of the founding uh, version, uh, uh, um, things of the German language. Uh, I mean, there's a huge amount of history and literature you can talk about without getting into um, the truth of the Bible or the falsity of it or, or anything about that like that at all. Uh, it's not the Bible as history or literature. It's the Bible in history and literature. Yeah. Yep. So, okay, go ahead. And then, and then this critique of Darwinism, a scientific approach, um, which is basically okay. A, now, if it's going to be a scientific approach, how can you argue that's religious? Well, see, but that's the whole thing that's been all along. That any time that you even suggest that Darwin was wrong. And there are other theories out there besides Darwin's, not just biblical creationism, but they just automatically assume that as soon as, soon as you question Darwin, um, then you're just automatically, uh, you're, oh, you're trying to push religion. Mm, no, sorry. Not if not you're not that. allowed to question uh, or critique a scientific theory, then that scientific theory is religion. That's dogma, then. Yeah, dogma. Um, I, you know, uh, I, one proposal is students allowed to distribute religious materials, talk about their faith, and pray. Obviously, that's their First Amendment rights anyway. Yeah. Uh, so you can, oh, can't do that. Uh, graduation speeches would not be re- regulated on religious content. Again, I think that's fair. It's First Amendment right. Uh, teachers would be able to ask questions about personal faith issues while maintaining a, a neutral position. Um, I, you know, again, if it's, again, what do you do when a student asks you? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, um, friend of mine that happened to when she was doing her student teaching in, in Madison. So, you know, real, uh, the education system, they're very liberal, uh, University of Wisconsin, uh, very liberal, not uh, real favorably inclined to uh, Christianity and that. And, um, n- you know, not when I say liberal, I don't just mean politics. And um, and she was doing her student teaching, and one of the kids in the class asked her whether she believes in Jesus and and whether or whether she's a Christian or, or something like that. And... Um, and, and you hear, you know, her supervising teacher is kind of looking at her, waiting for her to answer, you know. And, and she knows that if she answers this differently than the teacher wants her to, this could seriously affect her grade. And so she's going, well, you know, she, she tried to change the subject. But there were a bunch of Christian kids in that class. And they kept pressing her. And finally she managed to change the subject. But these kids were really upset. They wanted to know. And, and um, so, I mean, it was time for recess and, and they go outside and she's out there, you know, um, doing recess duty. And, and the kids are coming up to her asking if she's a Christian and going, we don't want you to go to hell and all this kind of stuff. Well, I mean, she was a Missouri Synod Lutheran and a very strong one at that. And, and, uh, and so she says, she kind of takes him aside and says, look, yes, I am a Christian. Jesus is my savior, but there's certain things that I'm, I have to be careful about talking about as a teacher. And, you know, and she, she kind of like calmed them down, you know, reassured them. But I mean, the reality is that legally she should have been able to say, 
personally, yes, I am. Okay. You know, next. And, but she should have been able to answer that question. And she didn't bring it up. Somebody else did, but, um, right. <laughs> I have to give, uh, this guy credit for, you know, really trying to come up with a comprehensive policy here that does its best. I mean, in, Hard part is he's really trying to also avoid the lawsuit. So the original policy they are trying to revise, and because um, uh, Americans United for Separation Church and State uh, were complaining about it, and so they're revising it to try to keep again. This is something try to keep them out of court. You know, you, you get some of these church, these, these decisions, and they wind up in court. Uh, you know, the school district's going to lose, uh, especially a lot of free case where where kids are distributing. You know religious materials or something and they tell them to stop and you just know some foundation is going to back a kid they, they, this, they, they're going to wind up in court and they're going to lose mm -hmm. yeah and the you thing is no matter which it's, way you go on this because if, if if you sort of follow the the first amendment on this like we've been talking about and allow this kind of stuff to go on then Americans United for Separation of Church and State or Freedom from Religion Foundation or the ACLU Although, I don't know, I'm not sure which side of the ACLU would land on this one. I'm never quite sure with them. But, um, but you know, you, you never know. I mean, no matter which side you go, somebody's going to sue you, <laughs> you know. So trying to, you know, this is that old, trying to come up with just the right wording. <laughs> so I... <laughs> This is, you know, this is the nice thing about being a pastor in a church. <laughs> you know, yeah, we have a preschool here. It's a Christian preschool. We tell them flat out, you know, <laughs> we, and, uh, so, you know, we're allowed to do that stuff, but I have to tell you, I remember, I'll never forget my first seminary class that I ever took. And it was, uh, it was actually, it was a Old Testament, um, pre sound class that I had to take. And... And the um, the student teacher or, or teaching assistant or, or whatever is one of the grad students um, was doing the class, and he opened the class with prayer. And having gone, having gone to public schools and public college all my life, I was I was completely shocked. You know, just for just for a few seconds, and then I went to seminary. seminary. <laughs> say a prayer together or something like that, you know, there certainly should be um, no reason that they can't do that. That's just exercising their First Amendment rights. Um, but, uh, but yeah, you know, it's just, it, it really becomes a, a big legal mess. And it's really, not, if, if people would just approach it with common sense, it would never be an issue. <laughs> Interestingly enough, in my school in Kansas City, Kansas, Junction Elementary School, we prayed before we ate lunch right up to I was sixth grade. Really? Yeah, we all got a trays. We all stood at the table. We had this, you know, thank you, Lord, for this food. Amen. <laughs> that was all the way up through sixth grade. Nobody ever said a word. <laughs> okay. But here's the question about this whole religious thing. Will you choose music be forbidden in the school? <laughs> Now, this is the second time we've heard about this. I think we covered this on an earlier show. Did we? I, You know, it sounded so familiar. Um, there is a uh, church down in Florida. This is a United Methodist Church uh, that was going to have a uterus, u uterist, um in which they were going to use um, a bunch of music by U2. One, with or without you, uh, and... Um, Beautiful day was going to be the opening prayer. And I thought there was a Catholic church that had done the same thing, that had had a, a, a U2 mass. Uh, now, somewhere 
We know that it, it started, um, according to the article, the Episcopal Church first developed it in 2003. It was first conducted in Baltimore in April of 2004. Um, but it has been kind of going around. And, you know, I really, if they're going to do this one, they've got to do When Love Came to Town. Um, I think it's the most explicitly Christian of, uh, at least of, uh, I haven't really followed you two in the past um, few years, but uh, back when I was in high school was when they were really big. And um, and and there's the, that song, uh, there's the, one of the verses is, I was there when they crucified my Lord. I held the scabbard when the soldier drew the sword. Uh, I held the knife when they pierced his side, but I've seen love conquer the great divide. And, um, you know, very explicitly Christian. Yeah. Um, yeah. The guy says, uh, the guy's name is Jeffrey Lentz. He's a United, first United Methodist Church in Pensacola. And he says, U2's music is so deeply spiritual that I think the corporate worship setting is a perfect place for it. Um, it's exciting for the oldest Protestant church in Pensacola to have a cutting edge worship service. So, oh. um, and the uh, churches that that hold it, you know, you, you go, okay, is this legal, it, you know, with all the um, performance rights and, and all that kind of stuff? And they say that uh, they don't have to pay licensing fees to use the music on the condition that the church donates any money raised by the service to charities benefiting the Millennium Development Goals, uh, to which Bono is an ambassador. And um, so after... Completing the European leg of their 360 Degrees tour, uh, U2 is going to take inspirational songs and the Church of the Spaceship overseas for North American tour that kicks off September 12th in Chicago. Okay. Okay. Now, well, I, 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 no licensing fee. That's pretty cool because I'd hate to see what you have to pay for a licensing fee for U2's music. Mm-hmm. Yes. Provided that you donate any money raised by the service to charity, does that mean you have to give up your entire offering for the week? Kind of sounds like it. I mean, well, I mean, how do they define? I, I want to. I want to know what their definition is. Uh, any money raised, because I mean, if you are, um, cause I'm, I don't know too many churches. I and mean, they said this: this United Methodist Church has two hundred people. I have a hard time seeing a church with 200 people give, being able to give up an entire week's of offer, entire week's of offering, unless maybe they do it over the summer when nobody shows up anyway, because uh, they're all out of, you know, they all want to get out of uh, Florida because of the heat. Uh, <laughs> but I'm seriously, um, I mean, I could see, you know, or, you know, over what we say we need each week, we'll give that money. I, I, I just want to know how they define, you know, money is raised. Well, you know, we. Um... We ended up uh, in Iowa uh, this, I think it was this past year, um, that we had two services that we had to cancel uh, because of snow. And uh, so you you can do it. It's pretty tough, though. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, because it really does sound like the whole offering for the week. Yeah, so that would be a little bit, but uh, you know, I don't know enough about I never listened to a whole lot of YouTube's music, so I think it's kind of a neat idea. Uh, I'm one of the people who, you know, I'm, I'm kind of open in my, my worship styles, and um, yeah, it's, it's, hopefully it would reach some people who normally wouldn't come. So, it's, you know, hope they're hoping to reach a, a younger audience. Um, although. Maybe it's just me. I, I, I guess if you, you, you let it be known this is a one time thing, that's okay. Uh, sometimes, I mean, you know, they used to have these bring a friend Sundays or these other services they used to hold. Uh, they used to send out, you know, the Missouri Senate headquarters. And I used to, I, I always got mad about it. And uh, the senior, my senior pastor and I, our first church, we both agreed it was false advertising. Because what we did that week was so different from what you did any other week that if somebody who came back the next week, we, we felt, you know, it was bait and switch. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Well, it never worked. I, I tried those a few times, and it never worked anyway. <laughs> like one year, the, the only, it was, you know, it was this bring a friend Sunday, you know. <laughs> we had 
one guest, and it was my daughter had a friend sleep over the night before and brought her to church with her the next day. She was the only guest. <laughs> oh, yeah, that worked pretty well. <laughs> and we had like a month of lead up into it, too. <laughs> Even the people that helped plan it didn't bring anybody. <laughs> Oh, well. I don't know. I, I wouldn't do a service like this uh, unless it was really... The problem, a lot of this stuff is spiritual and, and might have some, you know, kind of good points in that. But I say if you're going to do something contemporary, give it some depth and, uh, you know, make sure that it has depth. And I haven't, you know, I haven't seen this. I haven't really looked that closely at their lyrics. Um, so... You know, where's how how deep does it have to be? Every pastor, every church has to kind of make that decision. But I'm I'm thinking that it's well, you know, it's it's probably not uh, wouldn't wouldn't cut my uh, you know make it to the level that I use as sort of minimum. So I think you need to be. Um Explicitly Christian. Yeah. Yeah, there's a difference between spiritual and Christian. So, um, uh, it's sort well, of like, let's talk about Bible translation here. Let's move on to that that yeah. topic. I can't think of a good segue here. but uh, um, Now, I have been, ever since it was published in 1978, a fan of the New International Version. Uh, even though... Um, the Missouri Synod kind of adopted the English Standard Version as its, as its uh, official translation. Um, <laughs> I'm very seriously thinking next year, uh, could we print out the readings each week, going back to the NIV? Because I don't like the way the ESV reads half the time. It's too something. Um, I trip over the words, and uh, they, 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 you know, there's... Uh, um, the word and beginning every sentence, which, you know, in English you could edit out, they, they have it there, and they use words like propitiation. I mean, I, I, I had to stand up there and, you know, translate that to my congregation, what the heck that word meant. Yeah. Um, you know, but anyway, so I'm an NIV fan. Uh, a few years ago, the New International Version, they came out with a new version called Today's New International Version, uh, which... Um, updated some of the language, uh, some of the, I don't know, instead of the, with the word Christ in the New Testament, they used the Messiah consistently, and I couldn't figure that one out. Um, and But they also then we were a little bit more inclusive, so that if it was, um, you know, Paul writing to a church, he said, uh, brothers, please do this, he, he wrote brothers and sisters, which is something which, you know, the, the word there really didn't mean the whole church, so you could do that. And so Eliminate some of that. But there was some people who really didn't like that. Um, it actually was uh, based on the New International Inclusive Version, which came from uh, which was done in England and caused a lot of things. Well, anyway, on Tuesday, um, the New International, the, the, the International Bible Society, which now has a new name, uh, it's now called uh, Biblica. Yeah, I think it's gone through more names. Fear of a name only increases fear of the thing itself. It's, I mean, it was started off as the New York Bible Society, then the New York International Bible Society, and then the International Bible Society, and now Biblica. So, yeah, well, um, you know, it's it's the whole domain name thing. <laughs> you got to have a short domain name. Oh, that's name. what it's all about. <laughs> well, I guess, yeah, if you, I did three W's, IBS. Dot com, yeah, irritable bowel syndrome is what that's better known as. <laughs> yep. See, see, you need you need a descriptive, you know. So uh, anyway, yeah. so they said they're going to come out with a new uh, edition to try to. They they admit that that the TNIV was not very well done. Yeah, and in fact, they're gonna as soon as this new one uh, is done. And they start publishing that. They're going to cancel. They're not going to. They're. Uh, it'll cease publication. The the TNIB will. So um, you know, a lot of these things. It, 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 you get into this whole question of translation. All right, and they, for instance, they talk about sons of God became children of God. Okay, 
the problem is in in okay so we re- um we received the adoption as sons okay well okay so as adoption as children well no it actually in a historical context it has to be sons because the daughters didn't receive any inheritance and it's talking about inheritance but we receive the adoption as sons we actually are become sons we become full heirs of the father's riches right, right. which is true but we don't have that distinction in modern america true so, you know it, <laughs> so it was important for paul to say that because that actually got a, I got that question. Ninety-five-year-old woman one time in my Bible class, Mrs. Paul. Oh, she was just a wonderful, wonderful woman. And Josh is listening. And Josh listening is going, "Oh yeah, she was the greatest." And she asked me that question. She says, "Why does it say sons of God, not daughters of God?" And I, <laughs> and I went through that explanation. But I said, "We would not say that today. We would say children of God because male, female, you inherit the you, you inherit the property. So, you know, for us." That distinction no longer exists. It was important for Paul to make it. But for us, it, it, it kind of is great because it's, you know, but it's, it does make the sense. At the same time, though, um, it's also, it also brings a parallel that just as Christ is the son, so we're the sons. You know, that God loves us, his sons, as much as he loves his son, capital S, you know. Um, God the Son, and it's, it's drawing that parallel. Um, and and really, you look at the whole, um, you know, out of Egypt I called my son, and it, that it's talking about Jesus. It's also talking about Israel. It's also talking about us, that He has called us out of sin and out of um, out of hell, uh, and to um, to salvation. And so, the problem it, you get into this whole formal equivalence versus dynamic equivalence uh, is really what the whole question kind of comes down to. Do you go with what the original words were or do you go with what it means today? And the problem that you run into is how far do you go to try to make it clear? And it really comes down to what is the level of theological education of the person that's reading it? All right. For instance, for me, when I'm studying, if I'm not using one of the original languages, or if I want to kind of check my translation, I will use either the World English Bible, uh, which is a free um, online Bible that's a very literal um, translation, or the NASB, and um, which is very similar to that. Okay, those um, f- from an, on an academic level. Those are are probably the best ones out there, um, in my opinion, as far as literal translations of good, um, uh, what I consider the most reliable manuscripts and and, and things like that. And so, but then on the other side, you've got, well, okay, but the average person that doesn't have, you know, a master's degree in, um, in, in a theological field is is really going to struggle with a lot of that stuff. You know, because when I read it, I can I can tell based on the English words what Hebrew word is is in the original just because of the way they translated it. Okay? Whereas um if if someone's looking for something uh, you know, are you okay, are you looking for a good study bible? Or are you looking for just a casual bible that you can sit down in your recliner and just kick back and read and and just enjoy the you know the message without mm-hmm. really digging in and looking at the specific words that are used and, and stuff like that. You know? So if I'm looking for just a, a general um kind of easy to read translation, I really like the God's Word or GWV, sometimes God's Word version, uh, which is another one that's available for free. Um but I've I've always been a big fan of that. It used to be called the. Um, sometimes you'll see older editions of it. That's the NET, the New Evangelical Translation. Um, and see, the NIV is good overall. But um, there's one thing about the NIV. I mean, there's there's a few things, but the one thing about the NIV that really drives me nuts is 
the the use of the word that should be translated keep, and it's the word where it says Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. And then later on when Jesus says, um, if you uh, if you uh, keep my commandments, then you're truly if, then you're you're truly my disciples, and um, and they translated obey. Two words, therapy. And the word there really is is not. It doesn't mean obey. It means something like um, you know to treasure, to really value. Now, obviously, you know God's commandments. If you if you value them, if you treasure them, you're gonna try to obey them. But the reality is that we don't always obey them. Well, that doesn't mean that we're not his disciples anymore. It doesn't mean that we, that he stops loving us or anything like that. Um, but we, we treasure them and because, and because that's what faith does. Faith holds to God's word. And so I know that it's a really minor thing, you know, but it's just every time I see that, I just want to, um, and when I used to read it, you know, before we switched to the ESV, um, I just wanted to, as I was standing up there in front of the church reading this, I just wanted to say keep, <laughs> you know, when I get to obey um, automatically, uh, just because I know that it's not quite right. You know? But I mean, you know, really the NIV is a very good translation. Um, you know, I if people are looking for something that's um, that's kind of easy to read, but still pretty faithful to the text, you know, um, to the original uh, languages and that. The NIV really has always done a really good job of finding that middle ground between the two. Interesting enough, because you talked about not quite right here, uh, the um, Douglas Moo, who is going to be the chief editor of this uh, new version, was, <laughs> they had the NIV in his own church. Uh, that's, I was reading about this in Christianity Today. And he says, every once in a while, his pastor will say, okay, this is what the NIV says. It's really not quite right. And he sits there and goes, yeah, you're right about that. Uh, so he says, you know, he said they made two errors. Um, one was that they froze the NIV in 1984. And then they got into this TNIV thing. He says, and those are two errors that they made. They should never have frozen it in 1984. It should have been continuously being updated, continuously being revised. Um, and I don't know if anybody, everybody realizes it or not. Uh, there is good Lutheran influence in the NIV, uh, and that, but it's not for, it wasn't from the Missouri Synod at the time. It was from the Wisconsin Synod. Uh, they were very impressed at our uh, at their the Wisconsin Synod's um, uh, language uh, language studies, and so uh, they worked on that actually at the very highest levels. Although I think for the Missouri Synod, I believe Robert Porris was part of the the the, the, the final committee. To approve everything, uh, I think he was pretty high up there too. So a little bit of Lutheran influence in it. Uh, actually, for to me, um, the two 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 biggest things is uh, in the Old Testament, where it, and it really is hard to translate it into English. Uh, 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 Yahweh Sabaoth, because I mean, you know, some people want to you know translate Sabaoth. Yeah, how do you translate that? It really means an army. And how do you picture that idea of the Lord of the Armies or, or what? Uh, and they have the term Sovereign Lord. Uh, man, okay, hi, John Calvin, right there. Uh, you know, sovereign is, is all over. And then, of course, Acts 3, uh, where uh, Peter is preaching, and he talks about, uh, and it says, uh, he must remain in heaven. And if they, they, you, know, if you want to see a more blatant bias, um, which, by the way, the TNIB tra- retranslated as heaven must receive him. So they, they translated that properly, um, finally. No, but, one more uh, thing that the NIV does, it talks, the, it uses the word, um, oh, and how does it do it now? I'm trying to remember. Um, but it talks about those who come to faith, and it and it makes it when they when they translate it, it's 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 passive in the original, and they translate it as an active thing, which is kind of interesting because it's not, you know, that's a would be contrary to Calvin. Um, but it's it talks about those who uh, darn I can't remember now. I know what you mean. Also, it's hard to translate that stuff and to make it read because yeah, it is passive, uh, but it it sounds weird. 
you know, well, and because yeah. even the in English the word believe is an active verb, right? So it's it's you know, uh, uh, and you know we often struggle with that. I don't know, but you know, m- you know my own preaching because you know you want to tell people you know come to faith, but at the same time, well, you really can't come to faith. You You're know? brought to faith, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, you know what would really be cool though, the tweet version. <laughs> the Bible in 140 characters. I've seen it. Oh, I wish or I less. Had... Yeah. <laughs> All right. So this is a Twitter site. It's um, uh, it it's twitter.com slash t h e k o t e l, and um, it's run by a guy named Alan Near. He's a resident of Tel Aviv, and what he'll do is you send him prayers. Uh, to this address, and then he will print them out and go stick them in the wailing wall, which is believed to be that if you put your prayers there, that's a a direct line to God. Um, As Christians, we have Jesus for that. We just take our prayers to him and, um, you know, our, our prayers. That's why we pray in Jesus' name why we use that, whether you actually say that or not in a prayer. As a Christian, we pray in Jesus' name that God hears our prayers. We know he hears our prayers because, not because we deserve to be heard, but because Jesus deserves to be heard and Jesus takes our prayers to God and and they go there. It's sort of with his signature. I tell people, you know, it's like um, when God gets our prayers, it's like getting a letter with Jesus has written the address on the envelope and in his own handwriting and God recognizes that and says, Ooh, I'm going to open this one first, you know? And, um, so it's, it's got his seal of approval on it. And, um, and so God listens to that. But, uh, yeah, he says, people trust me with their innermost feelings and secret thoughts. It's my duty to provide them with what I promised. And so he, um, goes and he's already put uh, about a thousand rolled up scrolls uh, kind of crammed in between the stones in the wall. I guess there just aren't enough rocks. I I thought it was interesting. Um, I I don't know. I got a bad feeling about this. Is this, you know, breaking like the second commandment? You know, Luther says we don't use God's name superstitiously. You know, the the the, the uh, LCMS says you know satanic arts, uh, which is a horrible translation of that. Uh, the idea was Luther going out and seeing people praying the Lord's Prayer over their pigs, you know, and you know hoping that they would grow be strong pigs. It was really this idea of doing it superstitiously. And I'm looking at this going, you know, this idea that if I if I take my prayer and I put it in this wall, then it's a direct line to God and God will answer that prayer then. Oh, good grief. I mean, it seems almost to me like a superstitious, uh, a manipulation of God. Mm-hmm. Yep. I mean, get God to do it's, it's like a book that I saw one time that said, how to pray and get what you want. <laughs> <laughs> you know? It's That's like how you... you got to Ohio. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> Yeah, I read this book, and if you know, if you say it just the right way, yeah, you, know, you can kind of dupe God into giving you what you really want. So, um, but yeah, no, it's and you I know, didn't it, read it, and I wound up in Massachusetts. Okay, <laughs> see, see, <laughs> get used to disappointment. <laughs> so, um, you know, one thing that I did appreciate about this though is he's not charging money for it. Uh, you know, we've talked about uh, these places where they will. Uh, well, there was there was that one that we covered a few months ago. Uh, where there's a website where you can pay to have them, um, you know, do the prayers for you. They they put it on their computer screen so God will read the prayers on the screen, and you know, just all kinds of goofy things where people actually charge money. Um, you know, to pray on your behalf or, well, I suppose it's like paying for masses to be said for you, honestly. Um, no offense to our Roman Catholic friends, but, uh, you know, if you're praying for somebody else to be spiritual on your behalf, you're kind of missing the point. Yeah, but anyhow, it's a thought there that I had. Hey, maybe you have a different opinion? Always write to us. We'd like your comments at... 
podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. Speaking of comments, we got a ton of comments uh, from our um, uh, episode last week. Um, and haven't gotten any negative ones yet. Uh, no. Everything we've been given has been very positive, uh, both from LCMS pastors I've heard from and ELCA pastors I've heard from. Uh, some who agree with Dr. Johnson and some who disagree with him. Um, uh, one person said, uh, even with the blockiness, it was a good interview, good analysis, clear discussion between the gentlemen. Uh, another person said, yeah, it was a great interview. I especially allowed, appreciated the interviewers allowing Dr. Johnson uh, adequate time to explain complicated issues. Um, next time, by the way, Dr. Johnson, feel free to introduce your dog because uh, he was barking in the background. Somebody else also mentioned that he should have introduced his wife when she walked by. So she said something about, it. yeah, you might see my wife flashing. And somebody said, I don't think that's a good idea. <laughs> But you can follow those comments on the American Lutheran Publicity Bureau boards at alpb.org um, and look for, look for uh, uh, a forum online. Um, a pastor out of California wrote to us, and uh, he was uh, – who, who knew um, uh, actually uh, – uh, who uh, knew uh, Pastor Johnson for some time back. And he also was uh, very impressed with it. Um, again, he he didn't agree with everything that he said, um, but he thought it was a. Um, uh, um, he he said, uh, uh, I was uh, I was uh, mildly surprised. I thought I felt was a more ironic tone than what I would have expected, and I thought he did a good and fair job of explaining things like the conscious bound concept and the various options without any due bias towards any particular one. Um, so uh, again, he, uh, all in all, I found this interview helpful and informative. So again, I thought that was a very uh, positive comment. Those are the kinds of comments we got consistently on it. Yeah. Uh, now we got a, um, there's one that, that really kind of surprised me. This is uh, from George, who um, comments a lot, which we really appreciate, um, who is an ELCA, a retired ELCA pastor. And uh, he was talking, he said that it um, uh, used to be that the LCA, which is um, one of the uh, denominations that became a part of the ELCA, um, had instituted psychological testing as a requirement for entrance to the seminary to help weed out gays from the ministry. And it says his, his daughter Ruth tells him about 40% of the seminarians are gay there. It was less than 5% during his time there. So 40%, you know, you talk about the, the whole question of um, of the, the, the uh, conscience clause that they have in that. Boy, when, when half almost half your pastors are available are gay... And uh, and if you don't like having women pastors, women um, are the majority at the seminaries too. It, that really cuts down on you know if 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 most of the of the seminarians are women, and then out of the guys, half of them are gay. You know you've only got like twenty five percent of the pastors left that are straight men. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm glad you pointed that out. Um, we also got, by the way, a couple comments uh, uh, from our uh, Scientology episode. Yep. Um, uh, one was uh, they, 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 they said, it's not a takeoff on Scientology, it's just a bunch of fans being goofy, you know, and, uh, and then corrected us our spelling on, on our pronunciation of, of what's his name. But then there's a... a uh, 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 somebody on YouTube, Beach Girl, uh, seventeen, and she said, uh, uh, "That'd be a super cruel wedding if it started transforming." So I must correct you. Uh, Shia would be the groom in each of our wedding fantasies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, not mine. Sorry, I'm not an ELCA pastor. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh. I know. I know. Uh, 
not not mine either. But I, uh, 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 but uh, that was a great comment. I I and I don't know if she's going to watch this episode, but really appreciated that comment. That was that made, that made me laugh yesterday. Yeah, yeah. I um, think I got it. Maybe so, you've got a comment. Uh, maybe you're going to do a U2 service, and uh, um, I don't know, yeah, maybe whatever. Maybe you've done one. What did you think of it? Maybe you've done one. Or been at one. Comment, to please, at uh, podcast at crossfeednews.com. Yep. I'd like to remind you, if you're watching this on uh, YouTube or, or Rever or Blip or one of those uh, places, that um, uh, feel free to, to leave comments at the bottom, like some of the people that whose comments we read on the show tonight. Um, and then, you know, watch future episodes cause we do, if they're, um, you know, reasonable comments and not just, well, we even read the ones that, where they just call us jerks once in a while, but, um, we, uh, you know, we, we like to just post comments there. We, we get those and, um, and, and a reminder that if you want to see this, the, the stuff that goes to, uh, because of the bandwidth limitations and the file size limitations that they have, um, on those file sharing or video sharing sites, um, we send a lower quality, uh, video to them. If you go to crossfeednews.com slash podcast, you can get a higher quality video. It's, uh, uh, larger. It's, it's uh, twice the size. Um, and it's, it's much clearer. And so, uh, if you're, you know, if you, if, if you're kind of annoyed by the quality of the video, Go and check that one out instead, and and see what you think, because uh, it's a little a uh, little more bandwidth. Um, but if you're if you've got broadband, if you're watching video, chances are uh, you've got enough bandwidth to be able to handle watching it anyway. So I want to remind you of that. So thanks everybody for, uh, for tuning in, and um, good night everybody, and God bless. Good night and God bless.